when Jeff asked me to teach this morning, I was super excited. Um, I was excited to see what God was going to put on my heart what to, to share with you. I was excited to see what God had for me in this. You know, when I teach, usually it's just me teaching out of what God has shown me, right? So I was really excited to see what God was going to show me. And, um, you know, I love, I love teaching. I teach the youth group all the time. Hi, Joe. I, I love um, teaching. I teach next door all of the time. And I, what I love to do with the kids is I love to be able to teach and to be able to maybe show them something that they haven't seen before or they don't know, right? We talk about it a lot. You know, I'll tell them, you know, prepare to have your mind blown, right? And I show them something maybe they hadn't seen before. And so as I was searching the scriptures and praying about what God was going to have me share with you, I was excited to see what that was going to be, right? And I just kept coming back to this same um, passage that I actually taught in youth group a month or two ago. And I kept saying, no, no, that's, that's not it. There's got to be something else, right? These are adults. These aren't the kids. And, um, and so I kept praying and kept searching. I kept praying and kept searching. And I just kept coming back. Couldn't get it out of my mind. Couldn't stop thinking about it until finally I just said, okay, God, I give up. Um, you know, I surrender. Um, so all that is to say that don't blame me this morning. You can blame, well, anyway, we'll move on. But before we get into our passage this morning, I did want to manage your expectations a little bit, as it were. Um, I'm probably not going to teach you something that you have not heard before. Um, You're probably not going to hear something that you've never heard um, or don't already know. My hope this morning is that you leave here encouraged and reminded. Right? Peter talks to 2 Peter about the importance of, of reminding God's people of spiritual truths that they already know, right? Peter says that he's never going to fail to do that, right? Um, And so that's really what I'm hoping to do this morning. So manage your expectations a little bit, right? But I do always like to to start, when I teach, I always like to start with a joke. Um, And as I was looking for a joke, I found this one. I thought, oh, that's very appropriate. Um, So (laughs) uh, after another long and boring sermon see how this is appropriate um after another long and boring sermon the parishioners the congregation was filing out of the church right and they're walking past the pastor and and not really saying anything right just walking out and towards the end of the line there's this old guy who always had something to say about the sermon right and so as he finally gets past he gets to the pastor and he he gets up there hi riley um he He gets to the pastor and he says, Pastor, today your sermon reminded me of the peace of God and the love of God. And the pastor was thrilled. He's like, that's awesome. No one's ever said that about my sermons before. That's really exciting. Why did it remind you of that? And the the old man said, well, it reminded me of the peace of God because it passed all understanding. And the love of God because it endured forever. So when I say that I hope you leave here encouraged and reminded, that's not the reminding that I'm talking about, right? But as we get into as we get into God's word, and we will in just a second, I promise. I think that there are three different groups. We could divide this room into three different groups of people um, in relation to the message this morning. Group number one, I think that there may be people in this room who have never experienced their life falling apart. They've never had their life come crumbling down around them. And if that's you this morning, I hope that you're able to look at our passage, our story this morning, and be better prepared for when it all does fall apart, because it will. That's group number one. Group number two, maybe there are people in this room whose lives are falling apart as we speak. This morning, you're in the midst of a storm this morning and you're not sure how you're going to be able to weather it. And for you, I hope that you leave here today encouraged and maybe with some hope. And for the third group of people in this room, that would be the group that, like me, you have seen your life fall apart around you. You have been through a storm and you're able to look back and see how God was working. And I hope 
for you that you're reminded of that time. You're reminded of that time and how God was there in the midst of that and how God was working in it. So as we pray over our time together, I ask that you examine your heart and see which group you fall into. Because I think that it will help you to relate to our passage this morning. I think it will help you to identify with David in our story this morning and hopefully be encouraged. So, all that is to say, let's, let's get into God's Word and let's pray. Father, we come before you, Lord, and we just thank you for the opportunity to be here. We thank you for your Word, Lord. We thank you how you have given us Father, everything that pertains to life and godliness, Father, in your word. And I just pray this morning that you would fill us with your spirit. God, that you would remind us and encourage us of your love and your sovereignty, Lord. And Lord, I just pray that you would speak through me. And um, God, that you would be glorified today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Turn your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 16. Just heard a collective groan from the youth in the front. We've been in 2 Samuel for a very long time now, at youth group. <clears throat> now, 2 Samuel, chapter, I guess I should turn there too. 2 Samuel 16. Now, before we get into our passage, I do have to give you some background and some context to what is happening here in our passage. Um, and I think it's important before I do that, that we remember that while I keep calling it a story, right, this is something that actually happened, right? David was a real person and all of these events really did happen. So even though I call it a story, it is actually history, right? And it's important to remember that, I, I believe. But as, as I give you some background to what's happening here, David is the king of Israel, right? David's king. He's been king for a while. Um, we all remember, right? Saul's been defeated. Saul's dead. David's the king. The, the nation's been prospering. Um, David's prospering. Everything's great. Everything is wonderful. And then we all know what happens, right? David makes a horrible mistake um, with Bathsheba. He commits adultery with Bathsheba. And then he has Uriah killed, Bathsheba's wife, right? Bathsheba's husband, thank you. Bathsheba's husband killed. And that Sheba gets pregnant, the baby dies as a consequence, right? And then we fast forward a few years after those events, and we see um, Amnon, right, David's son, and who is the heir to the throne at this point, right, Amnon. Amnon rapes Tamar, his half-sister, right? And David, David doesn't really do anything about it. He's kind of paralyzed. He doesn't punish him. He doesn't do anything. And so Absalom, Tamar's full brother and Amnon's half-brother, kills, murders Amnon, right? And then he flees the country. He flees the country for three years. And so he's basically exiled for three years after these events. And then finally... David's, after, after a lot of prodding from David's advisors, right, David allows Absalom to return to the country, right? So he allows him to come home, but he still doesn't reconcile with Absalom. In fact, he refuses to see him. He says, yeah, you can come back, but um, I'm not going to see you. I'm not going to forgive you. I'm not going to reconcile with you for two more years, right? So now it's going on five years since Absalom has even seen his father, let alone be reconciled to him. And after two years, David finally um, decides to forgive Absalom and reconcile. They get together, they have a hug, it's a whole thing. Um, but by this point, Absalom is so bitter towards his dad, he's so bitter towards David, that he starts to undermine him in the eyes of the people. And I'm sure you probably even remember that story, right? Um, what would happen in those days where the people would bring their problems to the king and he would um, advise them, help them solve their problems, right? And so what Absalom did is he would sit at the gate and he would intercept them as the people are coming to talk to David. Absalom would stop him and say, hey guys, um, you know, the king, he really doesn't have time for you. He really doesn't care about you, but I do, right? So tell me your problems. And Absalom would, would, would advise the people 
and at the same time undermine his father and basically telling him, hey, you know, David really doesn't care about you, but I do. And eventually what would happen after this went on for quite a while, um, Absalom turned the hearts of the people away from David, right? And, and towards himself. And essentially he forms a coup to overthrow David, right? And so seeing that David, seeing that he had lost the hearts of the people and he knew that he wouldn't win in a civil war with Absalom at this point, that he wasn't going to be able to fight him off, David is forced to flee. He's forced to leave Jerusalem, to flee in shame and in fear of his life from Jerusalem. And so he, he leaves, and he takes with him those, those people who are still following him. But he has to run away, because Absalom is coming. Absalom's coming, and Absalom's going to kill him. And so as we pick up in chapter 16, David's on the run, fleeing from Absalom. Oh, and David just found out earlier in chapter 16, David just found out that Mephibosheth, one of my favorite Bible characters, Mephibosheth has betrayed him as well. Mephibosheth being Jonathan's son, David's best friend, Jonathan, his son, who David essentially adopted as his own child and treated him like his own, he has also betrayed him. Or so he thinks. We find out later that it's not true. But at this point, David doesn't know that. At this point, David believes that Mephibosheth has sided with Absalom as well. And so as we pick it up in 16, verse 5, we see David's life is crumbling around him. He's lost everything. He's lost his crown. He's lost his country. He's essentially like lost his job. His family wants, his son wants to kill him. Like every, he's lost everything. And everything is falling apart. And he's fleeing. He's running away. So let's pick it up in verse 5. And we're going to read 5 through 14 in chapter 16. Let's follow along. Now when King David came to Bahurim, there was a man from the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera. Coming from there, he came out, cursing continuously as he came. And he threw stones at David, and at all the servants of King David, and all the people, and all the mighty men who were on his right hand and on his left. Also, Shimei said thus when he cursed, Come out, come out, you bloodthirsty man, you rogue. The Lord has brought upon you all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose place you have reigned. And the Lord has delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom your son. So now you are caught in your own evil, because you are a bloodthirsty man. Then Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, said to the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Please let me go over and take off his head. But the king said, What have I to do with you, you sons of Zeruiah? So let him curse, because the Lord has said to him, Curse David. Who then shall say, Why have you done so? And David said to Abishai and all his servants, See how my son who came from my own body seeks my life. How much more now may this Benjamite? Let him alone and let him curse, for so the Lord has ordered him. It may be that the Lord will look upon my affliction and that the Lord will repay me with good for his cursing this day. And as David and his men went along the road, Shimei went along the hillside opposite him and cursed him as he went, threw stones at him and kicked up dust. Now the king and all the people who were with him became weary, so they refreshed themselves there. Amen? Amen. All right. So David's life is falling apart. He could legitimately say, right, it can't get any worse, and then what happens, right? It's just like in the movies, right? It can't get any worse, and then it rains, right? Except in David's situation, it can't get any worse, and then it rains rocks. Right? Out of nowhere, David's life is falling apart. And out of nowhere, as they're walking on this dusty, dirty road, you have to get the picture, right? <coughs> they're walking on the road, and there's a hillside on the other side of the road, and it just kind of follows the road. And as they're walking, this guy just shows up, stands on the hillside, and follows them as they go, and he just throws rocks at them the whole time. Right? I mean, it's one of my favorite Bible stories because it's just kind of hilarious. I find it really kind of funny. And you have to remember what's going on in David's life. He's been fleeing. We saw in the last chapter that as David leaves Jerusalem and he's climbing the Mount of Olives out of Jerusalem, that he is weeping and mourning. Right? And he's lost everything. His life is falling apart around him. 
And then this guy shows up and starts throwing rocks at him. Now, Shimei, the guy throwing the rocks, Shimei was a distant relative of Saul's, right? He was a relative of Saul's. And he says that God is punishing David because he's a bloodthirsty man because of what he's done to Saul. Now, my question, first of all, in reading this, this is the first time we hear about Shimei in the Bible, right? My question is, where was he all of those years that David was king, right? All these years that David's been king, where was Shimei? Why didn't he, why didn't, well, you know, why didn't he bring this up before, right? He just does it now, right? He, he sees David down, David's down, and now is his chance to kick him while he's down. And so he takes that opportunity. And the things that he's even saying about David, they're not even true, right? He says, God's doing this to you. God's punishing you because of what you've done to the house of Saul, right? You're bloodthirsty toward the house of Saul, and so God's punishing you. But that's not even the case, right? In fact, the fact that Shimei is even alive to throw rocks at this point speaks to the fact that David wasn't bloodthirsty towards the house of Saul, right? He was a relative of Saul. He should be dead, but he's not. And the fact that by the end of our story, Shimei is still alive and still throwing rocks speaks to the fact that David obviously is not bloodthirsty, right? So it's not even true. The things that he's accusing David of are not even true. Now, partially true. He says that it's because of your evil. He says you're caught in your own evil. Now, that's true. We're going to see later on this morning how this is indeed true, that David has brought a lot of this on himself, but not for the reasons that Shimei is accusing him of. So what we're going to do this morning is we're going to look at how David responds to Shimei. Because I think there are I think there are three things that David does in this situation that we can learn from and that we can apply to our lives when things come crashing down. When the storms of life come, three things to do when it's all falling apart. So we're going to take a look at those things right now. So picking it up in verse 9. Then, so he's cursing him, verse 9. Then Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, said to the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Please let me go over and take off his head. But the king said, What have I to do with you, you sons of Zeruiah? So let him curse, because the Lord has said to him, Curse David. Who then shall say, Why have you done so? Now, David would have been well within his rights to have Shimei killed. In fact, there's even a law in the Old Testament that said, you shall not curse the king. Like that's a, It's literally there in Leviticus. You shall not curse the king. So David, and this is really the last thing that David needs, right? He's got enough going on. He doesn't really need this. Nobody would blame him. He would be completely justified to say to Abishai, yeah, go take off his head. But he doesn't. In fact, he doesn't do that at all. David has, his life is falling apart. And this is really the last thing that David needs. He doesn't need some dude standing on the hillside throwing rocks at him right now. But instead of saying, Abishai, go kill him, he does something else. He, number one, the first thing he does, he looks up. He looks up. He says, God told Shimei to do this. In fact, in the next verse, he says, God ordered him to do this. David's life is falling apart, and instead of lashing out, he recognizes God is sovereign even in that situation. He recognizes that God is in control. God is sovereign. You know, the Bible tells us in Ephesians 1.11, In him also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Not some things, all things. He works all things according to the counsel of his will. And even in Job, at the end of the book of Job, after Job has gone through everything that he's gone through, and God finally reveals himself to Job, Job says this in Job 42. He says, I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. See, God is in control. God is never surprised. He's never shocked. 
He's never like, um, you know, surprised by what happens. I say it to the kids all the time, right? I never say nothing happens in your life to where God's like, huh, I didn't see that coming, right? That doesn't happen with God. Nothing ever happens where God's like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do about that one, right? Like that doesn't happen. It can happen. God is sovereign. He's in control of everything, even the little thing. I remember, so, so I'm a big sports fan, right? I love watching sports. I love playing sports, as you can see from my very athletic build, right? Um, and I remember when I was young, someone, a man, man, I, I deeply respect and um, love the Lord greatly. Remember him telling me one time, I used to really get into sports, right? I used to really get into it, um, you know, you know, praying at the dinner table for my team to win and things like that, right? And um, I remember, I remember this person telling me, you know, God really doesn't care who wins the Super Bowl. God really doesn't care if your team wins or not. And I thought about that for a long time. And I've matured. I don't, I don't pray for sports teams anymore, so you know. Um, but I came across this verse. And it's really amazing. Proverbs 16, 33. It says, The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. The lot is cast into the lap. We'll leave that on the screen for a second. The lot is cast into the lap. What that means, back in that day, right, what they would do to make decisions is they would cast lots, right? We see this at uh, the crucifixion, right? The Roman soldiers cast lots and he would get Jesus' robe. Right? And basically, casting lots, the idea, it's kind of like dice. Right? You'd roll the dice, and that's how you made your decision. This verse says that the lot is cast, the dice are rolled, but even how the dice land is from the Lord. Right? God cares even about the small things, even about the little things. He's still in control. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 10, 29, Jesus is talking, he says, Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin, and not one of them falls to the ground apart from your Father's will? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. Right? God cares even about the sparrows that fall. We recently, this week, we had a bird die in our yard, right? Jonah came in and he said, Hey, there's a bird dead in the yard, right? <coughs> so, I went out to go deal with said bird. I couldn't find it. I don't know what happened. Um, the dog ate it or something. I, I don't know. But I go out to look for it, and it was amazing as I was doing this, I was thinking about the fact that, you know what? God cared about the bird. God knew then the bird died and where the bird fell. Right? God cared about that sparrow. He knows about that sparrow. And if he cares about the sparrow, how much more does he care about you and me? How much more does he care about the trials and the difficulties and the tribulations that we go through every day? Amen? It kind of reminds me, kind of reminds me of Elijah, right? And this is one of my favorite Bible stories, Elijah on top of Mount Carmel, right? You remember this story probably. Elijah and the prophets of Baal, they're on top of Mount Carmel having a cook-off, right? They're trying to decide, trying to see which God is going to consume their sacrifice first, right? Now, it's, it's, it's Elijah by himself, and it's 450 prophets of Baal, right? He's a little outnumbered. But Elijah lets them go first, right? And they're out there, and the Bible says that they're like dancing around, and they're yelling and screaming, hooting and hollering, trying to get Baal's attention. Remember this, right? They're trying to get his attention. Nothing's happening. And eventually, they're still not happening. They start, the Bible says they start cutting on themselves, trying to get Baal's attention. They're cutting on themselves. The Bible says they're, they're bleeding profusely or something, right? Like, it's, it's, getting, it's getting ridiculous. And I love this story because Elijah's just, he's just savage with these guys. Because as this is going on, and it's getting late, they've been doing this for a while, and nothing is happening. Elijah says in 1 Kings 18, he says, And so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is meditating, or he is busy, or he's on a journey, or perhaps he's sleeping and must be awakened. I just, I love this because Elijah's like, dude, guys, you just got to be louder, right? Baal's, you know, maybe he's on, he's taking a nap or he's busy. We all know that busy there actually means like in the bathroom, right? 
Like he's like, dude, guys, Bale's in the bathroom. You got to be louder. He can't hear you, right? Um, or he's on vacation. He's on vacation. You got to be louder. And I love that story. I love that. Again, it's a story, but it is history. I love that because we don't have to worry about that with God. We don't have to worry about God going on vacation, God being distracted, God not being there, God not hearing us. David recognizes that truth. David, in this situation, recognizes that even though his life is falling apart, and this little mosquito, this little insect of, insect of a man is tormenting him, David realizes God has allowed him to, and God is in control. Our lives might feel like they're out of control, but it's never out of God's control. So that's number one. Number one thing David does when his life is falling apart, David looks up. He recognizes God's sovereignty in his situation. Number two, David looks around. He gets perspective. I'm gonna, the next verse, verse 11. So he says in, in 10, we see, he says, let him curse. Who shall say then, why have you done so? Verse 11, and David said to Abishai and all his servants, see how my son who came from my own body, seeks my life. How much more now may this Benjamite let him alone and let him curse, for so the Lord has ordered him. This easily could have been the last straw for David, right? This, this easily could have been enough is enough. David's going through a lot, and this small, insignificant problem could have been the last straw. We do that all the time, or at least I do, right? We have big problems going on, and it's the small, stupid little thing that causes me or us to lose our temper and to lash out, right? It's that dumb thing that really isn't the problem. It's really not that big of a deal, but that's the last straw, the thing that causes us to lash out. But David doesn't do that here. He looks at what's going on, and he says, look, Shimei is the least of my worries. My family's a wreck. My son wants to kill me. And it's my fault. I'm responsible. See, David recognizes that he deserves this to a point. We often, when difficulties happen, we cry out, it's not fair. I don't deserve this. My son, maybe many of you know my son, son's 11, and he is obsessed with fairness, right? He wants everything to be fair all the time. He, uh, we've been, he's been playing basketball for the last few months, and it drives him crazy how the refs in basketball, the referees, they don't always call fouls consistently. They don't always call fouls fairly, right? Not everything is always fair 100% of the time, and it drives him absolutely bonkers. And I tell him, tell him all the time, Right? Well, the fair only comes once a year, and the fair is where you get cotton candy, but it doesn't really seem to help. I don't know why. It's not, it's not seem to helping his situation. But we are just like him, really. We want to be treated fairly. And we think that when things happen to us that we don't think we deserve, we get upset, right? We want fairness just as much as anybody else. You know, Romans 17, wrote, sorry, Romans 7, 18 says this. It says, for I, know that in time, that I, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. Paul says, I know that in me, nothing good dwells. Jesus even said, right? Jesus said, why do you call me good? No man is good, but God, right? No man is good. Nobody's good. We, the fact of the matter is that most of the things that happen to us, it's not even close to what we actually deserve. We always hear the question, why do bad things happen to good people? But the real question should be, why do good things happen to bad people? Right? Because there's nobody good. 
David recognized that he wasn't an innocent victim in his circumstances. In fact, Nathan told him that this was going to happen. Now, this would be the point in this story, if I was making the movie of this story, this is the point where there would be like a flashback scene, right? Where David's saying this and he's thinking this and all of a sudden it flashes back to Samuel, 2 Samuel 12, when Nathan is confronting David on his sin with Bathsheba. Nathan comes and confronts, you remember, he talks about the lamb and he's like, hey, there's this landowner and he took this poor little boy's lamb and it was the only lamb he had and he loved him like a child. I remember that, right? And then David says, oh, that's terrible. He should be punished. And Nathan says, you are that man, right? And so then Nathan says to him, he says, look, David, there's going to be consequences. And he says in 1211, he says, thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up an adversary against you from your own house. And I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor. <clears throat> and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. Nathan told David this was going to happen. He said, there's going to be an adversary that rises up from your own house. That's Absalom, right? Your own son. David knew this was going to happen. And as David is sitting here and his life is falling apart and Absalom wants to kill him, David recognizes, he remembers, Nathan said this was going to happen. The fact is that a lot of the difficulties in our lives are a direct result of our own actions. We like to blame God for outside influences, but in reality, most of it comes from us. See, sin has consequences. The Bible says that we will reap what we sow. Galatians chapter 6, you guys are probably familiar with this verse. Galatians 6, 7 says, Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. We sow to the flesh and we reap corruption. The word corruption there, it means decay or destruction, right? We sow to the flesh and then we wonder why we're shocked, we're surprised when what we reap is destruction and decay. We wonder why our life is falling apart. We wonder why we go through these terrible things when we've been sowing to the flesh. He tells us it's a promise. David understood this truth. Now, important caveat, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that God wants us to be healthy, wealthy, and happy all the time. Right? It's not what I'm saying. In fact, Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation, right? You will have trouble. So we know that's the case. But Peter says, in 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter said, for what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. He says, basically he's saying, like, what credit is it if you suffer for doing evil? Right? He said that there's no crown in heaven, right? There's no treasure in heaven. When you die, you go to heaven like, God, I should have a lot of, I should have a lot of treasure because I suffered a lot because of my sin, but I suffered a lot. Like, there's no treasure for that. No crown for, for suffering because of our own sin, right? Peter says, Peter says it's commendable before God if you suffer for doing good. If we're going to suffer anyway, if we're going to have trials and tribulations anyway, it may as well be for doing good. It may as well be for living for Christ and not for sowing to the flesh. But just like in this situation, a lot of our heartache is brought on ourselves. And we have to have the perspective to look at our circumstances when everything is crashing down and not blame God for it. When we recognize that we aren't innocent victims, it keeps us from blaming God or wondering why this is happening to us and it allows us to keep perspective and learn from it. Too often we go through trials and tribulations and we're too busy saying, Why, God, why? Instead of, what, God, do you have for me in it? Right? What can I learn from it? How can I be better for it? So that's number two. 
David, number one, he looks up, recognizes God's sovereignty. And number two, he looks around, he gains perspective. He understands his role in this, his personal responsibility, his culpability. Now, number three, David looks forward. Verse 12, David continues talking. He says, it may be that the Lord will look on my affliction and that the Lord will repay me with good for his cursing this day. When it was all falling apart and it couldn't get any worse, in the middle of the storm, David was able to look forward to the future and say, not only is God in control, not only do I deserve this, but God has a plan. God is sovereign. He is in control. He has a plan. He also loves us. He also wants what's best for us. Romans 8, 28, we all know this verse. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. Amen? God has a good plan, a plan that's better than yours, a plan that's better than mine. You know, the Bible says that God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts, right? God, I hate to break it to you, God knows what's better for you than you do, right? God knows what's best. We have to trust in that plan. You remember Joseph, right? We are all familiar with the story of Joseph. His brothers sell him into slavery, right? He ends up going to prison after being falsely accused. And then he gets forgotten by people that promised to help him, right? And as we fast forward years and years, we get to the end of that story. And Joseph, now being second in command of all of Egypt, confronts his brothers and they think that he's going to send them to prison or worse. But Joseph makes this incredible statement in Genesis 50, 20, when Joseph says, But as for you, he meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. We have to remember that even in the midst of the storm, God has a plan and he is in control. Amen? Amen. In Isaiah 43, the Bible says this. Isaiah 43, 43, one, 2, it says, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. This is an amazing passage. It's an amazing verse because he doesn't say, hey, you're my people, so you're never going to go through waters. You're never going to walk through fire. He doesn't say that. He says, hey, you're my people, so when you go through the waters and when you have to walk through the fire, I will be with you. It reminds me of my favorite Bible story. I've heard me say that a couple times. My favorite Bible story, though, is Daniel chapter 3, right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? They, if they didn't trust God, if they didn't go through the fire, then they wouldn't have seen Jesus. They had to experience the fire to experience Jesus in a new and a powerful way. And seeing Jesus was so awesome that when they could get out of the fire, they didn't want to. You remember? You remember that story, I'm sure, right? Nebuchadnezzar says, bow down or you're going to go in the, the fiery furnace. They say, no, we're not doing that. Throws them in the fiery furnace. And then... Um, and Nebi looks, and Nebi's like, wait, how many people we throw in? And his guards are like, hey, we threw three in. And Nebi says, I, I see four. And one as is the Son of God. Right? Amazing. And then they're not burned at all, but their ropes, their bonds are burned. They don't get burned at all. Right? And finally, so they could have left whenever they wanted. They're not tied up. But they don't until Nebuchadnezzar calls them out. Because they didn't want to leave. Because they were with Jesus. They would rather have stayed in the fire with Jesus than leave it without him. Folks, when, when my world was falling apart, when everything that I thought I knew, when everything that I thought I had was crashing down around me, on my darkest day, the darkest day of my life, that was the day 
that I heard God speak to me in the most clear and powerful way. It's an experience I'll never forget. I never heard him speak to me that way before, and I have never heard him speak to me that way again. And it it was so powerful. It changed my life. It changed the course of my life. God knows what he's doing, and he has a wonderful and a remarkable plan for you and for me. And this horrible thing that's going on in your life right now, if we can be like David, and we can look up, and we can recognize God's sovereignty, we can look around and gain perspective, and we can look forward to the future, then maybe, maybe we'll see Jesus in it. In fact, in fact, Look at the next verse, because this is the best part of the story. The best part of the story, and we're almost done, I promise. The best part of this story is the end. Because in verse 13, he says, And as David and his men went along the road, Shimei went along the hillside opposite him and cursed him as he went, threw stones at him, and kicked up dust. Now the king and all the people who were with him became weary, so they refreshed themselves there. even though Shimei was still throwing stones. David's circumstances haven't changed at all. His life is still falling apart. He's still running from Absalom. He's still lost everything. He's still miserable. Everything's crashing down. Even though that's all still going on, his circumstances have not changed, says he was refreshed. Shimei's still throwing rocks at him but he's refreshed. Even in the midst of that storm, in the midst of that tribulation, he was refreshed. Because when we go through the fire with Jesus, we can be refreshed even in the midst of it. Even though it doesn't make sense, even though David had no right to be refreshed, even though it was all falling apart and Shimei was still there, David rested on God and his plan and he was refreshed. So, I hope that you are as encouraged by this story as I was. Life, life is hard sometimes, and the storms of life come all too often in our lives. And when they come, I hope that you're able to remember this story of David and Shimei. And remember to look up, look around, look forward. Recognize God's sovereignty in your life. Recognize your responsibility. And recognize that God has a plan and he has a wonderful future for you, whether that's here or in heaven. That's the sequel.